Learning to Listen, TV show and podcast series, Conversations for Change. Presented by the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. Hosted by Joshua Sparrow. Dr. Sparrow is a child psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School, the author of nine parenting books, and is the executive director of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. The center was founded by T. Barry Brazelton, who was one of the most influential doctors in pediatrics and child development of the 20th century. Conversations for Change. Opening your eyes for new voices on parenting. Brought to you by the Burke Foundation. Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams and Santa Clara First Five. Hello, I'm Joshua Sparrow, Executive Director of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. Thank you so much for joining us for Conversations for Change, Learning to Listen. The idea for this TV show and podcast series came out of our wish to honor the life's work of Barry Brazelton. He wrote a memoir at the end of his life called Learning to Listen, and it's our hope that as we learn to listen to babies, children, parents, and to each other, that we can get to better understanding in this world where there's so little understanding and so much noise. Today's guests are Yudi Bennett and Elaine Hall. They are warrior moms. They both have children with autism and have created incredible careers, which have helped many kids. Yudi Bennett is the co-founder of Exceptional Minds, a program that helps autistic young adults learn about post-production and animation, leading to careers in Hollywood. She's also the founder of the Foothills Autistic Alliance and secretary of the Uniquely Abled Project. Elaine Hall is the founder of The Miracle Project, a musical theater program for autistic children which helps transform lives. Elaine, as well as her program, was profiled on the Emmy Award-winning HBO documentary Autism, the Musical. She is also a speaker, author, and media consultant. I want to now turn to Elaine Hall, who is the founder of The Miracle Project, and I'd like to show a little clip from Autism, the Musical. <laughs> I pulled together a group of parents who I think may be interested in having their kids be part of the group. I'm Elaine. Kristen, nice to meet Hi, you. Kristen, nice to meet you. And they're skeptical. I know they're skeptical. I'm asking them to put their faith in me that their child can sing, dance, and act live in a stage performance in 22 weeks. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Miracle Project. My name is Elaine. These are a lot of our, our staff and our volunteers. I have no idea what's going to happen. I really don't. I can promise you the first couple of weeks are going to be chaotic. I, that I can promise. There'll be kids that may not want to come in. There'll be kids that may come in and want to hide in a corner. They're, they're, you know, I don't know. I really have no idea. But what I do know is they'll be walking into an environment of people that are going to love them and accept them and be with them for who they are. And I just love that so much. And I have to tell you, in learning about your work, I just keep on wondering, how did you learn to be so fearless? <laughs> You're just so brave. I know you went to Russia to adopt your son from an orphanage. Your son is not speaking. 
he's a young man with a lot of thoughts and a lot to say, but he doesn't speak with words to communicate them. You bring these parents and these children together and tell them you don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know that they'll be accepted and loved for who they are. Where, where does your fearlessness come from? <laughs> I, I think that, well, thank you. Um, fearlessness, I, I think it, it, it comes from faith mm. and um, mm. love. Mm. Um, what you talk about so much is listening mm. and really the truth, not knowing any better. <laughs> 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 like, I don't know, I don't know, it just feels right, let's mm. do it. And mm. um, I, I worked in the TV and film business as well as an acting coach mm. and when my son um, came to me. He basically spun around in circles and stared at his hand for hours at a time. And today we know that it was autism, but again, just like you know, Yudi was saying, we didn't know from autism. And all I knew was I wanted to connect with my son. And he, you know, was not speaking, and he did all these strange. I didn't know autism. I just thought I got to connect with him. And so I used what I knew. Um, which was music and movement and just to, to connect, to be with him. And that's really was based on need, desire, faith and, and love. Faith and love. You know, there are ways in which a diagnosis can be helpful and being clear and having some way of understanding, but it also can get in the way of being able to access what you already know uh, who you already are that you can bring to the challenge and to the child who you love. I want to now turn to Yudi Bennett's work at the Exceptional Mind Studio and School. Nobody ever asks a kid with autism, what is it you'd really like to do? At this school, we ask, what is your goal? What is your dream? Exceptional Minds is a vocational training program for young adults on the autism spectrum who want to have careers in computer animation and visual effects. I think young people with autism are totally underestimated. It's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of young adults with autism are unemployed or underemployed. A lot of young adults still live at home. A lot of them suffer from depression and are very isolated from the rest of the world. And the opportunities for them are very limited. Our full-time program runs three years. We have a work readiness program. We outsourced about 30, 40 shots to the team here. They did fantastic work that we can put into a movie and be proud of it. It's great. I mean, we want to do it again. I mean, we couldn't ask for a better team member. Everyone needs a little bit of help. And I have a studio full of artists. They're storytellers, they're dreamers. Everybody has to be treated a little special and different. Does it take a little hand-holding? Yes. Does it take a commitment that we will not stop until this succeeds? Yes. But that's how we make movies. We all have the same dreams. We want significance, dignity, and purpose with our lives. We have an opportunity to give those three words to every single student at this school who will actually be able to go out and participate in the dream. This is my first full-time, full-paying job. I primarily work in After Effects. I learned After Effects at Exceptional Minds. It seemed like a good place for me to fit in because I was interested in animation. Right from the first day that Nikki set foot in our company, he was producing work for us. We saw what level of professionalism is being instilled in them from the very beginning. This was the first opportunity where Nikki could combine something he loved to do with something he was really, really good at that could eventually lead to employment. When we first met Kevin, he was working at a supermarket bagging groceries and they said he would never amount to anything else. I work at Stargate Studios and uh, I'm a junior compositor. I mainly do like rotoscoping right now and I'm still learning. I think that you find great talent in the most amazing places. 
The students at Exceptional Minds have had a fair amount of training to get them ready for the visual effects environment. If it wasn't for Exceptional Minds, I might still be at the supermarket and I might be living at my parents' house. Everything's changed. Nikki has purpose. It feels like I'm a member of society now. He's capable of making it on his own. Once you get inside and you see what's really happening there, you immediately want to be a part of it. It's the dream factory, you know, of the movie business. And, and if you can connect people with their dreams, then the magic happens. One frame at a time. Every time I see that, I have to hold back the tears, Yudi. And I know for you, this work is personal. I was watching your face while we were watching that together. And so just tell us a little bit about where did this beautiful idea come from? Well, I think when you receive a diagnosis like autism for your child, y y as young as they are, I think one of the first things you think is, what is going to happen to my child when he grows up? And worse, what is going to happen to my child when I'm not here? So I know this sounds ridiculous, but from the time my son was diagnosed at the age of three, my husband and I were immediately talking about, what was he going to do when he grew up? You know, what, what, what would he be? What kind of um, uh, future was there for, that, for him? And unfortunately, in 1997, there weren't a lot of things happening in the world of autism. So the future was looking very, very bleak. So getting to an ex exceptional minds was really a 15-year process. <laughs> And it came out of your own work, or was it a radical uh, twist in your own career trajectory to do this not just for your son, but for so many other people's children? Well, I had spent 30 years in the movie industry, so it wasn't entirely radical. But I always worked in production and in live action, so the whole world of post-production was new to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, my connections in the industry helped uh, get Exceptional Minds started, and I have learned post-production. <laughs> Good for you. And I don't think it's ridiculous at all to have that question from very early on. And I'm sure that there are parents all over the country and the world who would agree with me that it's not ridiculous to start very early on asking that question. I think we have a question from our audience. So ah. let's um, take a look and see. How do you deal with people who don't understand what autism is? who judge your child or who blame you? Well, I think you have to educate the people that don't know what autism is. And I think what's changed a lot, and I'm happy about this, is uh, when Noah was diagnosed in 1997, families did not want the diagnosis. We used to call it the scarlet letter, the letter A. Mm. And p parents didn't want the diagnosis. Now, um, we fortunately live in a time when there are a lot of education materials. There are things like uh, The Good Doctor and Atypical running on television. So there are opportunities for people to really learn about autism. And I think that it's much easier to accept the diagnosis uh, than it was back, what, 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, in, in, in response to your question, I think it's also what is the intention of the person who's asking? If it's a well-meaning person, then I'll answer in a very well-meaning way. Um, if it's someone being really judgmental, and I, I, was, I had a story just recently, I was buying flowers for Mother's Day, and the florist overheard that I was an expert in autism, and um, he said, well, you know, I think that that uh, it's the parents' fault, and if the parents were more, you know, uh, attuned to their child, especially the mother, and I, I said, you know, that's based on. Uh, Dr. Bruno Bettelheim's work that we've now put to, to rest, that um, it's not, it's a neurological difference. And I was being very kind and, and educational, as you were saying, and, but he wouldn't stop. So I finally had to say to him, you know, you're an expert in flowers, and, and I know my work with autism, so can you sell me some flowers? <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's really what the intention mm. is. And the most important thing, like you know, what, what Yudi was saying, is that we need to um, educate our, our children to love themselves, to know mm. themselves, to really honor who they are as having a neurological difference, to see their gifts, and to help our small world around us become ambassadors so that more and more people really understand who, who our children are. 
And what do you do about the professionals who think they know better about your own children than you do? <laughs> well, I'll be happy to talk about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, you had some I mean, experience with that. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a very difficult time getting Noah diagnosed again because it was 20 years ago. We actually took five different doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists. Uh, the first one told us he didn't have autism, so we went out and celebrated, mm -hmm. and then only to find, find out he had the diagnosis later. Um, I think that doctors are being bed, better educated now, too, which helps. But in our case, you know what? When the doctor wouldn't accept it, we said, fine, goodbye. And we went elsewhere and found another doctor. And I think that parents have to be willing to, um, they have to be able to speak their mind. I think if, if you know something's wrong, I mean, I think about Noah, at the age of two, he wasn't eating food. He wouldn't eat any of the finger foods that kids ate. All he wanted to do was uh, drink milk. And we took him to the doctor and we said, we think something's wrong. And the doctor looked at me and said, be stricter, he'll eat. Well, my son would have uh, starved rather than, than eaten. I mean, I knew my son and I knew that that wasn't right. So I already had bad feelings about it. But I think do your research, ask other parents when you're looking for professionals, you know, um, I wouldn't go with Yelp, but I would, uh, <laughs> I would definitely talk to other parents and talk to the professionals you are working with if you need, if you need somebody new. My son, I mean, he was severely autistic. He spun around in circles. He stared at his hand for hours at a time. And um, I, uh, I was in denial. I didn't want, it's like, don't give me any bad news. I just, I went all the way, to, you know, to Russia to, to adopt him. And, mm -hmm. and I was ready for Little League and, um, you know, all the things, the soccer mom. So I didn't want to hear anything. That's why I connected with him. And um, when he got the diagnosis, and I was ready to listen, and that's, I think, really important for the listeners and for professionals, that a parent, a denial is, is um, something a parent may need to go through and really honor that, honor that parent's process. Mm -hmm. Because once I was ready, I was like, full force. I mean, we went to Washington, D.C. And, and met with Dr. Stanley Greenspan mm -hmm. and where I met Dr. Brazelton. And so once I was ready, I went full speed ahead. I have to add something, though. I'm glad, I, I'm glad you're saying this because I forgot to mention the part where I sat down and cried for a month. Oh, yes. Before, when I, I was first hoping got one of you would talk about just how painful yeah. all of I this is. I sat down is, and yeah. cried for a month because you know, the whole time you're pregnant, we, well, we were playing a game. My husband went to Dartmouth, so we were playing the game. Would our son go to Harvard, where my brother went? Would he go to Dartmouth? Which school? We were doing all of that stuff. And all of a sudden, I had a kid. I wasn't sure I could get him through kindergarten. And this was a, such an awakening, awakening. I can't even begin to explain it, I don't think. But I think that parents have to understand that it's okay to have that sense of loss, that it's okay to have that realization that your life isn't going to be what you thought it was going to be, but that doesn't mean it's going to be bad. Yeah. It could mean it's going to be better. Well, talk a little bit about uh, what people who aren't familiar with children, individuals with um, atypical neurodevelopment. I have students who come to me who have never had a friend before, they've never had a connection. I'm talking 15, 16 year olds, I'm talking 20, 30 year olds. And um, myself, my staff have been trained to, to join that world. What interests them? Why look at, if, if they're really into cars, why look at that as, a, um, as something wrong? But looking at it as, wow, what, that's so interesting. It's your passion mm -hmm. and really helping, helping the neurotypical world to understand the world of those who are atypical in, in development. So I want to pause again because I think we've got another question from our audience. So, Hi, um, I have a question. I guess um, it's about my son and my wife. My son's been diagnosed with autism and my wife will not address the issue and she's afraid to tell people in our family that he is autistic. I think that she thinks it's maybe a reflection of herself, and I just don't know how to approach the situation. That's a little bit like my story, I would say. I mean, not only, uh, I didn't accept it at first. It was really my husband that they convinced me by being very supportive. 
So I think you need to be very, very supportive of your wife and give her time to process all of this. Um, I will say my mother, Noah's grandmother, would not accept it either. She couldn't believe that her grandson wasn't perfect in every way. And I had to show her that he was perfect in every way. <laughs> That's it's what just, I was going to say. <laughs> there's different definitions of perfect and, and how you see things. But uh, what helped me were uh, reading books, joining groups. When there were no groups out there, my husband and I actually started a group, which started my journey. Um, but don't try and do this alone. Don't try and do it alone. Uh, incorporate your friends. Incorporate um, other families that both that have autism and that don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, just to add to, you know, a little bit what you do with saying is um, just help her to showing her. I mean, TV shows like Atypical, uh, The Good Doctor, programs like Udi's program and 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 my program like Exceptional Minds and The Miracle Project that there's so much hope and there's so much goodness that we don't need to think of autism in a, in a negative way. So I, I'm wondering how you learn to listen to them so that they could tell you about the gifts that they have that I think in both cases became part of the inspiration for the work you've brought to so many other children. I learned early on that um, all behavior is communication. When my son was thirsty one time with my father, my son pointed to the dog's bowl so my dad could understand that he needed water. Mm. With my students, we had a, a child that didn't speak and just screamed all the time, but we'd notice that when music came on, she would sing a little. We would join her in the singing and giving her like, you know, eight bars to sing on stage until, as she puts it, one day opera came out of her throat and she's now an opera singer. So and we've had kids say their first words on our stages mm -hmm. and kids who are non-speaking, like my son, who types to communicate, mm -hmm. share deep thought mm -hmm. and deep meaning. I want to um, ask if you can say a little bit more about the hard parts because they also need to be spoken to because they're, they're real. And I had a unique experience, well, a different experience from Elaine's and that my son had language when he, until he was two and a half he had about 50 words he could say mom and dad and then literally one day if he stopped talking mom was mmm and dad was duh and he could only say syllables so we had to first of all we had to learn how to listen because we were used to him talking to us speaking in words and all of a sudden he couldn't do that and it was so frustrating for him that he would he started tantruming a lot when he lost his language because of his inability to communicate. He would just lie on the floor and scream and weep. So we found it difficult to go anywhere. It became really isolating. Or we'd go out, say, to dinner, and uh, Noah would start throwing a tantrum, and we'd have to get up and leave. I can't tell you how many events we tried to go to. So one of the things that actually my husband did is we realized that we needed a community. And what started my advocacy and his, um, we started a group called the Foothill Autism Alliance. And I brought along our Autism Power Pack. And we created this to help parents. We were lucky enough to get a grant. But it's a 400-page book of resources for parents. Again, this was pre-internet. But we, gave out, we ended up giving out 3,500 copies, free to parents, to help them connect. And out of this, um, it was part of a, uh, I guess you could call it a support group. We like to call it an education group. We brought in speakers. We had networking sessions. And our goal was to get parents to talk to each other, to have a group. We threw uh, social events because our kids just weren't always welcome at social events. I mean, you know. in fact, I look back now, and a lot of my friends disappeared. A lot of my friends who had typical kids disappeared. They were busy getting their kids into private schools and talking about where they were going to go to college, and that was just no longer my world. And it was kind of hurtful, but I went and got better friends. <laughs> I got friends, and a lot of them through Foothill Autism Alliance, we became very close, and we actually just celebrated our 20th year. Mm. So it's an idea that's stuck. But I think I would recommend to any parents that uh, you need to find a support group, and again, 
that can mean a lot of different things. It doesn't have to be a formal group. But in our case, since it didn't exist, we started one. Mm -hmm. I like to say that the Miracle Project doesn't cure autism, but we cure isolation and loneliness and separateness because the parents become part of our community and the students become, they, but one of our students once said, uh, I found my people. <laughs> well, one thing I can say too is um, when we couldn't go grocery shopping because my son couldn't be in the supermarket and the tantrums. And, but the things I remember are the cashier, after I'd had everything there, you know, piled up and ready to go out the door, and then my son started having a tantrum, where I had someone come and help me bring my son to the car, and the cashier you know, making sure that everything was all rung up and said, don't worry, the person behind you bought your food for you. You know, wow. so I think that those little gifts mm -hmm. of the community being supportive and understanding meant the world to me. I couldn't agree more. All through elementary school, Noah was never invited to birthday parties. And every year, I would, we would throw a huge birthday party, the bowling party, mm -hmm. the petting zoo. I mean, you name it, we had it. All the kids would come and nobody would ever invite him. And then finally, a mom invited my son mm -hmm. to a birthday party. Look at the smile and on your face when you say <laughs> that. I, I sat down and cried. I mean, yeah. it was so amazing. And, but here's the best part. I thought, well, he'd be sitting in a corner. I'd get there to pick him up. I thought it was just gonna be a disaster. I get there and he's, it was a Harry Potter party and he was sword fighting with the wands, just <laughs> like every other little boy. Um. Well, you've both done such a beautiful job of listening to your children and helping so many others learn to listen to them and to other children who have had a hard time having their voices heard. And you've both been able to listen to their dreams and to help their dreams come true. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. I want to be sure to thank our sponsors for Conversations for Change. Mitchell Gold and Bob Williams Home Furnishings, the Santa Clara First Five, and the Burke Foundation. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for uh, this Conversation for Change, Learning to Listen.